monster madness. It's time to get into the spirit of Halloween and monster madness or monster madness today. Every October, I like to do something a little different, and this time I'll be checking out some new horror and monster movies. And by new, I mean they just came out. I was thinking how there's so many that release direct to streaming, it would be fun to watch some of those and review them as they come out. This is exciting for me because it gives me an excuse to watch brand new stuff instead of always just going into my familiar Rolodex, digging into classic horror and things from the past, which I enjoy and will continue to do. But today's pick is equally nostalgic as it's a reboot of the classic 60s show, The Monsters. And right now it's on Netflix, at least here in the USA. I'll tell you what I think. You ever have a time when two of your favorite things come together? In this case, for me, it's Rob Zombie and The Monsters. So before I get into the movie, let's talk about those two things. First of all, Rob Zombie. Hands down, he's one of my favorite entertainers and one of the few rock stars who is also a filmmaker. He began his career in music, then started making films later. He was in his late 30s when his first feature film came out, House of a Thousand Corpses. I relate to that since I've had an equal passion for music and film. Rob Zombie is an example of a guy who does both. He records an album, he goes on tour, he films a movie, and he repeats that cycle and just keeps on going. He's gotta be one of the busiest, hardest working entertainers out there. And he seems like he's always having a lot of fun. He doesn't really have any messages. He just entertains and doesn't take himself too seriously. That's pretty evident in his music, which is the perfect marriage of monsters and metal. White Zombie was one of the first bands I got deeply into, and his solo career is phenomenal. I remember buying the CD of Hellbilly Deluxe at Sam Goody and hearing it in my car for the first time. I was blown away. And since then, I've seen him live 13 times. His shows are explosive and epic. He's an incredible performer. He still has a ton of energy when he's on stage. His films, I have mixed opinions about. I think Devil's Rejects is by far his best. That one's amazing. The others I could say good and bad things about, but above all, he's a major fan of all things horror and pop culture. You get the sense that he's grown up watching and listening to everything that exists. So of course he would love the monsters. After all, his most famous song, Dragula, is a reference to the Monsters race car. Likewise, The Monsters is something that's very dear to me. The original TV show ran from 1964 to 66. Those were the days when shows didn't last long, but the impression it made would be felt for generations to come. For me, The Monsters had the distinction of being the other 60s black and white sitcom about a spooky family of eccentric characters. Of course, I'm talking about The Addams Family, which debuted only a week before The Monsters. I love them both. To this day, both are iconic and both had their share of reboots. The Addams Family especially was very successful at reinvigorating itself with the 90s reboot. So while The Monsters has similarities, it has its own tone and stands apart. The appeal of the show boils down to many things. First, even though they're a family of monsters, they're depicted as a regular human family, specifically suburban, American, and specifically of the time period. It's lovable because it's so typical, but so self-aware, making fun of that wholesome family sitcom formula. Second, it's clearly a tribute to the classic Universal monsters, but not in a predictable way. Al Lewis as Grandpa is the traditional vampire character, but he's not doing a Bela Lugosi impression. He's his own unique character with a style of acting that is so distinctly Al Lewis and nobody else. And he's also sort of filling the mad scientist role since Grandpa's always doing experiments. Yvonne DiCarlo as Lily has sort of a vampire look, but with a hairstyle similar to Elsa Lancaster in Bride of Frankenstein. Butch Patrick as Eddie is sort of a werewolf, and finally Fred Gwynn as Herman is the spitting image of the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein using the classic Jack Pierce style makeup. 
In fact, the makeup was done by Bud Westmore, who worked at Universal during the later years with Abbott Costello Meet Frankenstein and Creature from the Black Lagoon. What made Herman so funny was that he doesn't act like the Frankenstein monster at all. He speaks in a regular voice. He's reading a newspaper or whatever and just playing the ordinary dad character. But then he acts like a goofball and has that silly laugh. <laughs> There's a lot of slapstick in the show. A lot of it is due to Herman's super strength. Things get broken, and even in the second season intro, he famously crashes through the door. I'm always a fan of breakaway sets. I don't know what it is, but I just can't get enough of characters smashing through walls. The show was canceled in 66 because of the usual reason, ratings fell. Because in 66, Batman came along and slam dunked that shit. The Munsters did return here and there. Right after the show ended, there was a color feature film, Munster Go Home. In 73, there was the mini Munsters animated film. In 81, there was the Munsters Revenge, which brought back most of the cast. In 96, there was the Munsters Scary Christmas, which had an entirely new cast. And here we are now with a brand new reboot. So let's start talking about it. I just watched it and here's what I think. First of all, the look. I really love the vibrant colors. It reminds me a lot of Munster Go Home. As much as I like the black and white look, I also enjoy how cartoonish the monsters appear when they're in color. I remember as a kid around the Halloween season, always seeing the Frankenstein monster in bright green. This is the way he'd appear when he was in TV commercials, uh, usually advertising candy or snacks. In fact, this whole movie looks like a retro Halloween commercial. It's colorful and fun. There's something about it. When you watch this, it just feels like it's Halloween time. The visuals embody all the familiar kid-friendly stuff I love about Halloween. There's castles, coffins, laboratories, a scientist flicking a switch, lightning, low-lying fog, bats flying by, and it's doused with splashes of hyper color. But how well does it represent the monsters, may you ask? Well, I think the biggest problem is that it takes too long to show us the monsters as a family. A large part of the plot is how Herman and Lily met in the first place. I think I would have preferred it being a continuation of the monsters rather than it being a prequel. That always seems to be the thing, start over. But I don't think that's what we wanted. We want to see them as a family because here we lose a lot of that formula that made the monsters popular. Even though they do eventually come together as a family, move into Mockingbird Lane, it all comes together. But where's Eddie? Scenes like grave robbers stealing a body, creating Herman in a lab, Lily having an awkward date with Orlock from Nosferatu, and random scenes of a werewolf visiting a fortune teller are all scenes that slow it down and get things off to a very weird start. I didn't know how I felt about this movie at first. It seemed just random and bizarre. But as soon as Herman came alive, so did the film. He's played by Jeff Daniel Phillips, and let me put it this way, he's no Fred Gwynn, but I could not stop laughing at how far he took it. There's no subtlety with Herman here. He's a full clown act. He doesn't dial it down at all. He goes like full Jim Carrey. Almost every scene, he's in a different costume and is out of control. He's telling bad jokes, which become funny only because they're so bad. There's a scene where he's wearing Groucho Marx glasses and a nose with a balloon on his head and holding a deck of cards and then out of nowhere, he does a Dirty Harry impression. You gotta ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Or do you punk? There's something hysterical about it. Like the way they build up to it by zooming in on the other characters' faces and their confusion just baffled just as much as the audience. Like, what the hell is going on here? But the Herman scene that I found to be legitimately funny was when Lily asks him to go out on a date and he forces back his excitement and plays it super cool. He's wearing a robe with glasses. He's looking at a book and he's like, well, I have many appointments, but I can move them around. Something about the delivery and the look on his face just cracked me up. 
but I'm not saying he saves the film or holds it all together. When you think back to the original Monsters, it wasn't a one-man show. There was a back-and-forth chemistry between Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis. But here, the dynamic is different right from the get-go because the grandpa role, played by Daniel Roebuck, disapproves of his daughter Lily dating and eventually marrying Herman. Roebuck plays it straight for the most part. At times, his voice sounds very reminiscent of Al Lewis, but he doesn't have the same comedic flair or the same lively, cartoonish facial expressions. Sherry Moon plays Lily. Her acting is definitely trying to channel something from the 50s or 60s, maybe a little closer to Morticia Adams than Lily Munster. It seems she shares more one-on-one -on -one screen time with Herman than the other Munsters, and there's nothing really special that comes out of any of these scenes. There's lots of references and obscure characters returning from the show. For example, Uncle Gilbert makes an appearance, plus the TV horror host Zombo, and also the Tin Can Man, which is supposedly played by Butch Patrick, the original Eddie Munster. Why he's hidden inside a robot costume and not even using his real voice beats the crap out of me. Speaking of cameos, Pat Priest, who played Marilyn Munster on the original, returns as the airline announcer. And it was cool to see Cassandra Peterson, best known as Elvira, as the real estate agent. I'm also glad the iconic Munster surf music is played at the end. Too many reboots forget how important the theme songs are. Though I would have liked to have heard a revamped version instead of just using the old recording. <laughs> so is this a faithful Munster's adaptation? Will it please old fans of the show? I don't think so, but if you think of it as something else, it's delightfully weird. Has a strange tone that's unlike anything I've seen. For me, the awkwardness is part of the fun, but I must emphasize, it's really awkward. It's not consistently funny, but as a casual watch, I enjoyed it. Mostly for its visuals. I loved the visuals. It could be perfect to put on as background during a Halloween party with some Rob Zombie music. Man, I love that kid-friendly Halloween look, not to mention it's the only Rob Zombie movie you could show to kids. I don't know what they'd think of it, but it's clean and innocent. No F-bombs, nudity, or people getting their skulls bashed apart. It definitely fulfills my love of monster nostalgia. And like I said, it is two of my favorite things coming together, Rob Zombie and the monsters. But not everything you love always goes well together. It would be kind of like mixing ice cream and beer. I don't know. That might be good. It would be different for sure. And so is this movie. It's different, but yeah. Good and bad. Overall, I enjoyed it.